In this <coughs> talk on practical understanding of higher order aberrations, I would try to bring the astronomical science down to the earth. Uh, Harry Truman's this quote uh, that if you can't convince them, confuse them, is no more appropriate than talking about higher order aberrations, but I'll try to convince you rather than confuse you. As Sir Duke Elder has said, a human eye is the most complex but most imperfect optical system which is comprising of cornea plus anterior chamber filled with aqueous as working as a lens one, about 42 diopters, crystalline lens as lens two and vitreous body as lens three. But because this is a biological system and not truly a glass uh, system, it is prone to so many aberrations and so many errors because of the biological deviations. Now what is an optical aberration? Now optical aberration is a departure of an optical system comprising of lenses or mirrors from producing a truly perfect distortion free ideal image of a given object. Or we can consider it as a qualitative disparity between an object and its image. Or we can call it as an imaging defects in simple words, it is loss of fidelity of an optical system, or you can tell it as an optical noise, and compare a hi-fi optical system, I mean, to a hi-fi optical system can be compared to a digital Dolby sound system. Or in other words, we can tell it that a point is not to the point. If the point source of light is not imaged as the point source of light, that means there is an aberration. So a point, not to the point is the aberration. Now since uh, the evolution of the mankind, stars have been the best point source of light for all of us. And because of the optical aberrations present in the artist's eye, the stars have been drawn with various kinds of radiations right from the primitive art till the modern art, you can see wherever a star is drawn, the star is never drawn as a point, but usually as a radiating source of light. Beginning from three radiations of the Mercedes-Benz star to four radiation of the Christian star or five pointed star of the militia and uh, military to six pointed star of the David of Jews seven-pointed star of the sailors representing the seven oceans, eight-pointed star of Venus or ten-pointed star. So the stars have been drawn by various artists depending on how they see the stars. And it was Fritz Jernicke uh, first, who was the first to classify and quantify the optical aberrations in 1935 and in 1953, he was awarded Nobel Prize of Physics for, for this great work. His polynomial expression is uh, uh, shown as this, where a Z uh, is having a numerator and, uh, uh, um, and uh, you know, subtractor. This is the order of abrasion. The abrasions are ordered from one to 15 and this is the order of the abrasion, and this is the frequency. So when you scan an abrasion from three o'clock position of the cornea, like a trigonometric circle in a counterclockwise from three o'clock, and make a full circle, how many times the same abrasion gets repeated in that circle is the frequency of abrasion, and which is mentioned here. Now, <coughs> The orders of optical aberrations are like this. The zero order is known as piston aberration. First order aberration is known as prismatic or tilt. Second order is known as defocus or end primary astigmatism. Third order is known as coma and trefoil. Fourth order is known as quadrifoil, spherical and chromatic aberration and secondary astigmatism. Fifth order is secondary coma, secondary trefoil and uh, pentafoil. Then sixth to 15th order aberrations are clinically insignificant. 
And theoretically, it can be infinite in number. It's not actually 15, only 15 are classified, but it can be infinite in number like a kaleidoscopic image. There is no limit how many aberrations can remain, be, be present in an optical system. And only second and third order aberrations can be optically corrected. All the aberrations above the fourth order are corrected either by human intelligence, neuroadaptation, or by artificial intelligence in case of space, uh, digital space uh, photography. So to talk about any order above four is like Balki Khal Nikalna. So we'll restrict our talk to aberrations up to order four. Now the zero order is known as piston, literally from the piston of an engine. And as we know that when we look at the engine from the top and if the piston is moving, when the piston comes closer, you feel that it has become larger. When the piston goes away, you feel that it has become smaller. So the image and the object do not match each other. So this is a quantitative variation, actually not a qualitative variation. And many a times it is known as not as aberration, but only as the magnitude of, uh, uh, sorry, magnitude difference between the magnitude of the image versus the object. And it is because of the piston abrasion that we see the sun and the moon are looking equal from the earth. Although the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but it is also 400 times away from us. The first order abrasion is known as prismatic or tilt or tip. Now this abrasion <coughs> will give rise to a rhomboid image of a square. If the square is not perpendicular to the visual axis, but if it is below or above, the image created on the screen or on the retina will not be a square or a rectangle, but it will become rhomboid. And that's why it is known as prismatic or tilt or tip. This is the example of a prismatic uh, abrasion. As we know that these all columns are truly vertical, but to us, it appears that they are slanting. Another example of a prismatic aberration. And another example of prismatic aberration is present in the LCD projectors because the projectors are usually tilted in reference to the screen and you have to do an electronic or an optical adjustment to, to correct it and it is known as keystone correction in the projector. And that's the reason why you like your screen of laptop to be perpendicular to your eye. And that's the reason why the podiums are also made tilted so that the books can be read easily and better. Second order aberrations we all know quite very well because we have studied this thoroughly. The positive defocus is myopia, negative defocus is hypermetropia. Astigmatism, having two focal planes, I need not go into the detail of this, we all know quite very well. Now the third order aberrations which are these days confounding or confronting our minds most are known as coma and trefoil. Now let us see what are they. Now the word, Latin word coma literally means a comet. And as we know that a comet has a head and a tail, head and a curved tail. And even the punctuation mark coma, the word comes from the Latin coma because it has a head and a tail. Now, if on a lens, the ray or the beam of the light is incident not parallel to its axis, but at an angle to its axis, what happens is that the peripheral rays will be focused at one point. Compared to that, the mid peripheral rays will be focused at a different point, And the central rays will be focused at a different point. And the focal length of central ray compared to focal length of the peripheral ray will be different as a result of which the image casted here will be pretty big. Image casted here will be small. Image casted here will be even small and image casted here will be a point. So there will be a smear in the form of a comma when the rays are not parallel to the axis of the lens. Or you can imagine that the, if the lens is tilted compared to the axis of the incoming light, the comma abrasion will be present. And because, because of this, 
when the pupil dilates and the peripheral rays start getting into the optical system, you will see that the stars will be pictured as comets. And this is the coma aberration because the camera is horizontal, whereas this light is too high and the light coming from this uh, floodlight, the beam of the light will, be not, will not be parallel to the axis of the lens, but it will be at an angle and as a result of which it casts a ghost shadow which is known as coma. Uh, in uh, telescopy and in photography, there is a device known as coma corrector. And this coma corrector, if we study, is almost exactly like human eye. So we can say that our eye, nature has given into our eye a natural built up coma corrector. The coma corrector comprises of a negative meniscus lens, a positive meniscus lens, and a biconvex lens. In our eye, negative meniscus is the cornea, positive meniscus is the aqueous uh, itself, and the biconvex is the lens itself. So to a certain extent, nature has already given a good amount of coma correction in our own eye. The clinical causes of coma would be traumatic mydriasis, traumatic subluxation of lens, decentered LASIK ablation, decentered PKP graft, iris coloboma, or an optical SI, very high angle kappa, eccentric pupil, or a Marfan syndrome, early keratoconus, or a tilted IOL like this with one loop in the bag, other loop in the sulcus. Now coming to trefoil, the trefoil word literally means three leaves, and this is quite common in the pre-Christian architecture, Gothic architecture, in the form of three leaves because this represents God, the generator, operator, and the destroyer, the trinity of the God. So a trefoil means three leaves, and for us the famous, most famous trefoil is the bilipatra, or the famous uh, uh, symbol of radiation or biohazard are also trefoil because they are having three foils. Now if point source of light is imaged by a trefoil liberated optical system, it will be seen as this, a star will be seen as a tri-radiating star. And you can see here that this light and this camera has a trefoil liberation so that you can see three radiation or three smearing of this. In clinical situation, the significant amount of sutural cataract or a subclinical sutural cataract can give rise to a good enough amount of trefoil liberation in our eye. A cataract something like this also will give rise to trefoil liberation or a cataract something like this also will give rise to a significant trefoil aberration. Now coming to fourth order aberration, which are spheric spherical aberration, quadrifoil and secondary astigmatism. As we all know that a, a normal spherical lens has a, a different angle of refraction in the periphery compared to center and the mid periphery as a result of which there is more refraction for the peripheral rays than for the central rays as a result of which the central rays come to a focal point here whereas the peripheral rays would come to a focal point here, and there is a, a, a big, uh, uh, you know, line of, uh, or, or depth of focus. In case of an aspheric lens, the surface gradient or the power decreases as you go from the center to the periphery as a result of which this refraction here will decrease and the, all the rays will come to a single focal point. If the peripheral rays are focused in front of the central rays, this is known as positive spherical aberration. Whereas if the peripheral rays are focused behind the principal, I mean the central focal point, then this is known as negative spherical aberration. And the spherical aberration, if it is significantly present in the eye, this will induce night myopia because in the night when the pupil dilates, the peripheral rays will start getting focused in front of the retina and there will be two images, so that causes night myopia. Uh, spherical aberration has an advantage that it gives a good depth of focus because it has a good 
number of focal points and gives a good depth of focus. Whereas an aspherical lens has a very sharp focal point, but it does not give you any depth of focus. Clinically, the spherical aberration of the human eye is uh, averaged at 0.27 micron with a standard deviation of plus 0.1. So it ranges from plus 0.17 to plus 0.37. And <coughs> the young natural lens has a negative aberration of minus 0.27 micron, as a result of which, up to age of around 2025, 20, the net spherical aberration of the eye is zero. At the age of 45, the natural lens changes its shape and the optical uh, uh, refractive index, as a result of which, the negative spherical aberration, which was present in the young lens, now comes to zero and the eye overall becomes an uh, eye with a spherical aberration of 0.27 micron and as, as the age grows, the lens from negative spherical aberration becomes positively spherically aberrated as a result of which the overall aberration from 0.27 goes up to 0.5 or 0.6. Uh, and now let us differentiate between Q value versus the spherical aberration because that is sometimes confusing. Now Q value is a surface aspherity factor. That is the cornea's front surface, how it slopes towards the periphery is known as Q factor. So Q, fa Q value only describes the anterior surface of the cornea. It does not have any unit and the ideal Q value of a perfect for a parabola, which will be having a zero aberration, will be 0 0.5. Mathematically, a parabola will have a Q value of minus 0 0.5, whereas the uh, corneal Q value is minus 0 0.26, and average is minus 0 0.26. So do not confuse uh, this minus 0 0.26 with plus 0 0.27 spherical aberration. Now, spherical aberration is a wavefront measured Zernike RMS value, that means it's a transmission factor. So when the light goes in and comes out, how much the light rays are deformed. So a spherical aberration describes the transmission property or refraction property of the cornea and the eye as a whole, whereas Q value only describes the surface aspherity. Uh, RMS is measured in micron. We'll come to some slide in uh, uh, why it is measured in micron. The ideal value of spherical aberration is 0 0.00. .00. Caucasian cornea is 0.27, but there is one study that Asian cornea has a mean of plus 0.37 because our <laughs> eyes are smaller compared to the Caucasian eyes, and as a result of which, the spherical abrasion is more because the sphericity is more than the uh, uh, sphericity of the Caucasian cornea. Uh, Now, spherical aberration in the IOL choice, my usual uh, practice is that in distance dominant eye, I implant an aspheric IOL with about 0.3 diopters as target refraction. And in the other eye, I choose a spherical IOL with about minus 0.3 as a target refraction. And this combination gives me, a, gives my patients a reasonably good contrast sensitivity, reasonably good distance and near vision, and it gives a kind of a pseudo multifocality. These are the two images of Hubble Space Telescope. When the Hubble was put into the orbit, it had some calculation error and it was put into the orbit with lot of spherical aberrations, which had to be corrected by NASA sending the space technicians in the space and in the space they repaired the Hubble and this is the image after removing the spherical aberration. So you can see the difference between the quality and the contrast of the two. Let us come to the quadrafoil. As the name suggests, quadra means four and foil means leaves. So these are, uh, you know, in the Christian uh, architecture you can see the quadrafoil quite very well in all the doors representing the cross or a famous BMW symbol is a quadrafoil because it is having four lips. And this is the fourth order 
aberration. And the quadrafoil typically to understand can be induced by four incision radial keratotomy. Now, if the pupil is small, the point source will be imaged as a point, but when the pupil starts dilating, as you can see, that a quadrafoil aberration starts manifesting itself. More dilated pupil, four millimeters, there is a classical quadrafoil aberration, and at five millimeters, there is a further quadrafoil aberration. And as you can see, that the contrast and the illumination brightness decreases as the pupil increases because of the aberration. This can be induced also by a misaligned toric eye wall because now there are two axes, the, the original corneal axis and the improperly placed eye wall axis. And this divides the entire optical system into four leaves, one, two, three, and four, as a result of which a misaligned toric eye wall will induce significant amount of quadrifoil aberration. The secondary astigmatism is the fourth order astigmatism. Now the primary astigmatism, as we know, passes through the center of the pupil. The, the principal axis passes through the pupil. In case of secondary astigmatism, the principal axis passes at the margin of the pupil. And as a result of which, it degrades the quality of vision, and these are the clinical causes which can induce significant amount of secondary astigmatism. The ablation of hinge in case of LASIK, a decentered flap with the flap margin coming closer to the dilated pupil margin, flap wrinkles or striae, or bitoric tissue saving uh, ablation for mixed astigmatism. Instead of doing a plus sphere and a minus cylinder, or a minus sphere and a plus cylinder, if you do a treatment of plus cylinder, and a minus cylinder opposite to each other in order to save a few microns, this can induce a very significant amount of secondary astigmatism. A very large SICS wound, when you do a very large SICS wound, you tend to go too much into the cornea to keep the lip uh, larger and self-sealing. And when you go and cut the decimate membrane pretty close to the dilated pupil's margin or mesopic pupil's margin, it will induce a secondary astigmatism. Post Murens ulcer or pellucid marginal degeneration can give rise to secondary astigmatism. Now, further than this, there are so many pentafoil, hexafoil, octafoil, nonafoil, so many kinds of aberrations which can be described, but which are clinically not correctable by optics and which are not very significant. And this can be induced by multi incision RK or this kind of uh, uh, cortical cataract. Look at this cataract. When the pupil is nice, um, is small, the vision is nice in daytime. But when the pupil dilates, it, indu it will induce number of foils and uh, aberration. This is the Zernike's uh, map of the aberration. It is known as Zernike's pyramid. And the, uh, uh, the abrasions are calculated in RMS value, which is the square root of the square of the mean, which I will explain in, the, in this slide. The RMS value is calculated like this, each peak and the corresponding valley. For example, if you take this map, you can see that there are three peaks, one, two, and three. And these are the three valleys. So there are three peaks and three valleys. That means this is a trefoil abrasion, because there are three peaks and three valleys. And the difference, height difference between the peak and the valley will give you the delta of the wavelength. That is the difference between the peak and the valley will give you the amount of abrasion. So, and that is measured in nanometers in the wavelength of light. So how many nanometers uh, height versus how many nanometers depth? So nanometer square, the average of three such value in case of a trefoil is taken which is then divided by 28.26 square millimeter because by convention, the optical aberrations are measured in the pupil of six millimeters diameter. Even if the pupil is widely dilated, only six millimeters is counted. And the area of the circle of a six millimeter is 28.26 square millimeter. So when you measure a nanometer square divided by 28.26 square millimeter, the resulting product will be a uh, lambda divided by a millimeter which will end up, I mean, the nanometer divided by millimeter, which will end up as a product of 
uh, as a micron. So it's known as micron or micrometer, or sometimes it is also known as microm. <coughs> And uh, recently at the last uh, ASCRS, the uh, Californian cataract, the so-called Californian cataract, the, uh, if, the, if there is too much significant abrasions present in a clear lens, then also it will be known as a cataract. And the term now has been defined as Zernike cataract from in, in this ASCRS. And the term was coined by Dr. Bhaiwasauda and if a uh, point source of light is focused here, you should be able to see it as a round, nice spot. I'll do a small experiment and ask you all to see this laser point. Close your one eye and see the laser point, whether you are able to see it as truly as a point or does it radiate. All those who are above the age of 40 will see it as a radiating star, not as a point. And uh, this shows your own abrasion. And now if you see, it will improve because the brightness of the background will make your pupil to constrict. And when the pupil constrict, the abrasion will decrease. S you can see it once again. Well, I tried my best to differentiate between an iPad and an iPad. And uh, as Dr. Zernike said, more abrasions are induced by this glass than any other glass. Thank you very much. <laughs>